Hello everybody. So you know the OGC web coverage service. In this webinar, however, we are going to introduce the web coverage processing service to you, or WCPS. This is a high-level query language which allows for server-side filtering and processing of massive spatio-temporal datasets. We are going to introduce you to the practical side of WCPS by showing you how convenient it can be to apply on-the-fly processing on your datasets using the query language defined by the standard. My name is Peter Bauman. I am editor of the WCPS standard. And my name is Vlad Merticario. I am one of the Razdaman core developers. So now we are getting to the next level of the game, Web Coverage Processing Service Part 2, Advanced Queries. We want to see some power queries and we'll see some new ways, some new expressions that can be utilized to do image processing, signal processing and linear algebra. Actually, for the prerequisites, it's as before, a little HTTP, a little bit XML is handy. And then, of course, you should have done the web coverage processing service basic webinar first or just otherwise be familiar with the WCPS specification. So, a quick refresher. WCPS, Web Coverage Processing Service, is a high-level query language that is built for spatiotemporal grid coverages. So, uh, this is an adopted OGC standard that integrates with WCS and works on multidimensional gridded uh, coverages. Actually, with this query language approach, it follows the big data code shipping paradigm where we send code to the data because data are too large typically to be shipped or they are so complex that we don't want to process them ourselves. And therefore, this is about server-side filtering and processing. The syntax is compact, like SQL or other query languages, and at the same time it enables highly effective server-side optimizations and parallelization. What's particularly good for the user is that only the exact results are sent over the network. You might call it what you get is what you need. This is, first of all, good service for the user. They don't have to unpack, extract, process, etc. And second, by transferring only the minimum of data that is necessary, is simply more efficient. Here is a small example. This says that we loop over uh, what is in parentheses, which is just one element, so our loop is executed only once. And variable $s is bound to each element, so in this case to Landsat scene. From this $s we want to know the absolute of the difference between red and near infrared, and that should be shipped as a TIFF image to us. So the response to this request would be a single TIFF image. So. We wanted to know more about it. What else can we do? One thing that is quite handy in practice is the switch statement that actually allows to choose different pixel values when different conditions hold. The syntax is, well, like the X query switch. So we have a case followed by a condition expression, return followed by a result expression, and any list of those case statements. Finally, an optional return statement for the default case. This switch statement is executed sequentially. So first condition expression 1 is evaluated. If it's true, then result expression is returned and the whole switch statement stops. If condition expression 1 is false, then condition expression 2 will be inspected and if true, the result expression will be evaluated and returned. Otherwise, expression 3, 4, etc. are inspected. If none of the conditions holds, then actually the default statement will be executed and will return a default value. Mind you that, as always with WCPS queries, those result expressions can be scalars or coverages, so single values or complex coverages. Let's see an example. Uh, color coding is one of the standard use cases for this statement. So, for pixel values below zero, we want to see black. For the remaining pixels, for the ones with values between zero and 0 0.4, use red, and otherwise color in green. 
if you look at the black image in the middle you don't see much that is the raw data and they don't have high intensity but if we color them with that query actually we can see something and this is something that we could nicely overlay with a map for example technically the query looks as follows we have some for statement that returns something that is encoded in TIFF and that something is given by a switch statement where we say case dollar c less than zero then return zero 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 okay so actually we return something that is all black if it's not below zero but it is below 0 0.4 then we return red and in any other case we return a green value. You see the RGB values as they are composed in these struct statements and each of them applies to a particular condition. So color coding is one example. Here is another one that's also very common. Sometimes we have illegal values uh, in the in functions like dividing by zero or log of negative values and with a switch statement we can nicely capture these cases and return something meaningful in case that happens. So for example for pixel values exceeding zero we get the log and for all others simply return zero. So case dollar c greater than zero we return log of dollar c and if it's less or equal to zero then we return zero. And the whole thing again is embedded into a TIFF file. Now, another thing. We want to combine different coverages. What we have seen earlier was that we iterate over a coverage and look at each one in turn. That means isolated. What if we want to have a fusion of different data sets? That actually corresponds to nested loops or SQL join or any other mechanism that is out there. The syntax is just we have a comma separated list of iterations and the semantics is that well we execute a nested loop. That's all. In the example here that we see we want to iterate over three modis scenes and extract the near infrared band as TIFF. But then we have an extra predicate that says only where near infrared exceeds the threshold somewhere in the region R. This assumes that R is a boolean uh, matrix that allows us to check whether um, we should use the pixel or not. So syntactically we have in our for loop uh, not just the $C iteration but now also $R iteration. And now all combinations of $Cs and $R are executed. For each of them the predicate is inspected where we look whether c.nir exceeds the threshold and does so inside r, so where $r has a value of true. And if we find at least one such pixel, if we find some such pixel, then we return the red component encoded in TIFF. So you see, nested loops means we can combine any number of different elements. Good. So we always massage existing coverages and we get back coverages that are relatively similar. What if we want to construct a completely new coverage? Then we use the coverage constructor. That establishes a new coverage with a particular domain that is given in uh, the domain specification, the over clause. And we fill it with values resulting from some expression evaluation. Syntactically, we have the keyword coverage followed by the coverage name. And then the over clause specifies the domain set of the coverage. We have n iterations corresponding to an n dimensional coverage. And we have a dimension name, so lat, long, ANSI date, hate, or whatever you want to use here. And in parentheses, for each dimension name, you indicate the extent. That actually establishes a matrix or an n-dimensional tensor and implicitly there is an iteration so that each of those positions is, expect, is uh, inspected exactly once and when it is inspected then the value expression is uh, evaluated and the value is assigned to that position. 
this value expression can contain occurrences of the dollar iterators and so actually the value can be dependent on the position. Hmm. That sounds quite abstract. What can we really do with it? Let's look at an example. We want to establish a 100 by 100 raster image where each pixel is the sum of its corresponding ind indexes. So we have something we call my coverage. In the over clause we say x iterates between 0 and 99 and y uh, is the axis that is also from 0 to 99. Altogether we have a 100 by 100 matrix. And for the values we simply add up the current coordinate $px plus $py. And so we get a value in each cell of the coverage which corresponds to the sum of its coordinates. Hmm. Well, that shows the principle, I guess, but it's not really meaningful yet. Let's do something real life. Let us assume we have a image, dollar set image is the variable bound to it, and we want to have a small part of it, just for simplicity, a 100 by 100 coverage, where we do the difference between a particular value and the value left to it. So it's a little bit like indicating elevation. So the coverage and the over clause is the same as before. The interesting thing now is the values clause, where we see that the set image is addressed with its particular coordinate $px, $py, but in the second one it's $px minus 1 and $py, so it's shifted in x position by 1. Okay, and these pixel values that we obtain here by indexing $set image, these we subtract from each other. Uh, by the way, we could do this in a simpler way in WCPS, but I found it nice to illustrate the principle using that. So we subtract the image from itself with an offset of 1 in x direction, and so uh, we get some indication of elevation. By the way, uh, you may notice that this image may overflow, we may get outside the domain set of an image, and if we are outside, then actually a null is assumed in that position. Okay, something else. The coverage condenser serves to consolidate or to aggregate coverage cell values. Uh, we could say it sums up, but it doesn't just sum. The result anyway is scalars. So we iterate over some coverage or part of it, and then we get back a result. By the way, we also can use that to iterate over time series, for example, and to consolidate coverage slices into a single slice. We will see examples, but first of all, let's get familiar with the syntax. We have the keyword condense and the condense operation. can be a plus, but can be something else like maximum, minimum or so. The over clause is something familiar to us. We know it already because this tells us about which area in multidimensional space to iterate. We have an optional WHERE clause, where we can exclude particular positions from being evaluated, if we want that. And the USING clause, finally, gives us a value expression, which is evaluated for every coordinate combination. As before, the value expression can contain occurrences of the iterator valuables, variables. Okay, that's the theory. Now, how does it work in practice? Well, let's for example assume we want to know the count of all cells having positive values in a one dimensional coverage dollar time series. So we inspect along this 1D time series one value after another, and if we find it to be positive, then actually we add the counter, we increment the counter. So our condensed statement looks as follows we have a plus because we do an addition, we want to count them together. We have an over clause which is the same as before, it iterates say from 0 to 99. And now it gets interesting, in the where clause we state that the time series position should be greater than 0. If it's greater than 0, then we evaluate the expression which is hooray 1. So we increment. If the condition is not fulfilled, the using clause is not evaluated, so nothing is added. And in the end, 
we get our count of all positive cells. So far so good. Let's increase dimensions. The next one is going into 3D actually. We talk about an image time series cube, dollar cube. And what we want to do now is we want to collapse it into a 2D slice by summing up all the slices along time. So for each location, for each geographic location, we want to drill through a long time and sum up all the dates. Good. Condense plus, we want to do a sum. Okay, that's clear. Uh, we now have a time axis. Time is indicated in a different way using the well-known syntax for timestamps. And so, what do we have? Ah, yes. From January 1st, 2014 through December 31st, 2014. Over this range we want to iterate and we want to extract the ANSI date $t of the cube. Wait a moment. This is not a scalar. If we do a slicing on time on a cube, the result is 2D. So actually the using clause returns a two-dimensional slice. And so our addition up there is not a simple addition of uh, scalars, but it's addi an addition of slices, that is component-wise addition. And therefore we achieve what we want. The result will be a single slice where uh, every location contains the aggregated values of all the time slices of all the timestamps that are available. That's now nice, isn't it? So not so much syntax for so few effect. Now actually we are getting really productive. Okay, it makes sense actually to combine both. Histogram is an example that we can look at. So we go into a Landsat scene and want to get the red channel histogram, for example. Uh, we would encode that in CSV, for example, and maybe not in some other binary format because CSV is simple, is good for such one-dimensional data that we get. Because the result now is a one-dimensional coverage, in fact. We call it my histogram, and the domain set is given by something um, that is a bucket, as we call it, and it ranges from 0 to 255, corresponding to the 256 buckets of an 8-bit integer histogram. Now what do we do in the value statement? We look at the red pixels, so we extract the red band, and we compare it to the current bucket value. So if we are computing histogram bucket 42, we would compare $s.red equals 42. And then we obtain a boolean matrix and we can nicely walk around and grab all the true values and count them. So at the end of this values evaluation we will know how many pixels we have with a value of 42 in the red band on in this image. Okay, and that is something that we do for all buckets. And in the end we have our histogram that is 256 values in a row. That shows us that actually with the coverage constructor we can really reshape a coverage totally. We can build a totally a new coverage that has nothing in common with the original one. By the way, I didn't mention this count. That is actually a shorthand for a condenser and there are several of them. The usual functionality that you know maybe from SQL, uh, that's the same thing here. So we have count, average, minimum, maximum, sum and all. So all the usual aggregate operators exist also as condensers. Another one, let's go into imaging. We want to do edge detection. For this uh, we use a kernel operation and a common kernel is the one shown here that is a 3x3 three three matrix and this matrix is placed over each pixel in the image and then the values of this kernel are used as weights to sum up the pixel values around and after the neighborhood is evaluated we get the value of the new pixel of the output image. So this kernel actually walks across the whole picture for evaluating the neighborhood. In our query Therefore, we need two objects. $s is my image, 
and $k is my kernel and we encode something as TIFF uh, which is constructed as follows. We have a coverage that we call edge filtered. The domain is the domain given by $s and the values now are obtained by condensing by adding up the evaluation of the kernel at our particular position $p. So looking at the red part at the bottom we see that $s dot red is evaluated at position $p but then actually a coordinate $q is added. Where do we get that from? Well, line above. It's the blue one. So $q is introduced here as an iteration that is from minus 1 to plus 1 in both directions. So you see that the center, the zero point actually of the kernel is in the center of the matrix. And so we address all the red pixels around $p. Each value that we obtain we multiply with the kernel value that we find at $q. So $q is here uh, dressing into the kernel. That is the common definition of the kernel operation of the Sobel filter actually and if you look at the mathematical formulation you will see that it's pretty much a one-to-one -one translation. So actually this is quite easy to learn. If you look at the picture to the right you find a typical web map service image. It consists of four layers, a ortho image at the bottom, then water lines and water areas as thematic layers plus a classified elevation model. This can be expressed as a WCPS query, so that can be retrieved from a service on the same dataset. To this end, we would establish a for clause that binds $p to orthophoto, $wl to water lines, and so on. In the return clause, now we describe the processing. First of all, we want to get back unsigned integer 8 bit pixels. So we say unsigned character as the data type, which shows us that cost operations are also included in WCPS. Then we start with the orthophoto. The orthophoto is a grayscale image and we want to have color images, so we need to multiply the grayscale value into the three RGB bands. This is done with a struct operator, which constructs a red, green and blue coverage, a three band coverage. And this is initialized with a value 1, which subsequently is multiplied with $p. And that gives us the gray channel, gray channel now in the three bands. This image is overlaid now with the water lines. Water lines is a binary image where 0 means there is nothing, so transparency. And the value of 1 means yes, there is a water line. We want to color that according to the scheme that the German mapping agencies use. And so we use an RGB value of 0, 128 and 255 for multiplying the value of 1 in the WL mask. Same thing with the water areas. Water areas contain a 1 where there is a water area and 0 elsewhere. And we multiply that with the corresponding color value, which is an RGB of 191, 255, 255. So now we have achieved the standard mapping part. The interesting part comes now, where we classify the DEM. So we have a switch statement, where we say case $d less than 260. If we are below 260 meters above zero, then we return a value of black. If we are above 260 but below 262 meters, we return a value of red. If we are above 262 but below 264 meters, we return a green value. And finally, by default, uh, we return, if everything else is not matched, we return a value of blue. Okay. So this gives us an image that is similar to the one on the right hand side where we can color DEMs on the fly and we can color existing images and we can combine them. By the way, we also can combine images of different size. With a scale operator we can homogenize them and then have all the operations for fusion available. So that was the 
inspection of what else WCPS offers. There is a few more stuff, but it would lead too far now. We are um, encouraged actually to look into the specification or to look at online tutorials on the webinars page that you see in the trailer. You will find more links. Now, finally, an outlook to the next version of WCPS 2.0 this in the make. Actually, this will allow one important step forward, that is combining coverage expressions on data with ex-query expressions on metadata. Two examples that show it. Now, the for clause actually is a fully fledged ex-query expression that says, in my WCS offerings, find all the coverages. The WHERE class looks first into the data and sees whether near-infrared exceeds a threshold somewhere. If so, yes, we want that image. And at the same time, it must be in the region of Austria. So that is now a metadata predicate. If an image and coverage matches both criteria, the full predicate, then the difference between red and near-infrared is returned as a TIFF image. So this is looking for some properties of data and metadata and returning the data, returning coverages. But you also can do a reverse lookup where you can say, okay, look again at all coverages and evaluate the difference, whether it's greater than zero. And only if this is the case, then return something, but not coverage data this way, this time. But actually what you want to get is some XML that delivers the identifier of the coverages and the bounded by area. So actually, this gives us the name and location of coverages showing some particular phenomenon. This is a little bit like a reverse lookup because now we search for data and return metadata. This concept has been implemented as a federation of BaseX and Rusterman by Jacobs University and Athena Research. And this is going to be one of the new features in WCPS 2.0. But enough of theory, so let's get hands-on, and Vlad will show us a few examples live. Let's see some examples of queries using advanced operations provided by WCPS. The dataset that we will be using is Average Land Temp, one of the datasets that we have used in the previous WCPS session, which is a 3D data cube containing average monthly temperatures during the day over time. The no data value of this data set is 99,999. The first operation that I want to show you is the switch statement, which is used to create a new coverage by choosing different pixel values when different conditions hold. In the previous session, we have selected a single slice from the temperatures data set corresponding to the average temperatures in July 2005. We can do that by typing for C in average length temp returning code C subset ANSI 2005 July PNG and we can tell the client to display it as an image. This is how the result looks like and uh, because the temperatures are floating point values displaying them in a PNG without any further processing is not very visually appealing. What people usually do are on-the-fly color maps. Let's assume that we want cells having value 99,999, the no data value, to be displayed as white pixels, cells having values less than 18 to be displayed as blue pixels, cells with values between 15 and 23 yellow pixels, cells with values between 23 and 30 orange, and all others to be displayed as red pixels. We can do that using the switch statement, and the syntax is the following. So the same for C in average land temp, returning code, switch, and here we start listing the conditions together with the pixel value that we want when the condition is met. So the first one we set for the ones having value 99,999 to show a white pixel. We can write that saying case C NC 2005 July equals 99,999 return 
a white pixel which we can uh, show with the range constructor. So red 255, green 255, blue 255. This will give us a white pixel. The next one, for the ones less than 18, return a blue pixel. Case C, NC, 2005, July, less than 18. Return red 0, green 0, blue 255. The next one was cell values between 18 and 23 to be shown as yellow. Case C, NC, 2005 July less than 23 return yellow so red 255 green 255 blue 0 you will notice that here I didn't write um, 18 less than C less than 23 because the conditions are evaluated sequentially and as soon as one of them is met the pixel from the return clause is put in the coverage. This means that um, all the pixels having value, values less than 18 have already been replaced with uh, the pixel that was provided here. So no need to rewrite the condition in the next case clause. The next one was the cell values between 23 and 30 to be orange pixels. So case C NC 2005 July less than 30 return orange that is red 255 green 140 blue 0 and all others that is all that are above 30 and not 99,999, we want them red. And we can say that we're using the default clause. Default return red 255, green 0, blue 0. Okay, let's see the let's see the result of this query this is how uh, our map looks like now with all the pixels in place besides color maps switch can also work with expressions so here we have used the scalar value we can also use expressions in the return clause so let us select again the temperatures in Bremen in 2010. We can do that by typing for C in average length temp returning code C subset we want to specify the latitude and longitude of Bremen that is latitude 53.08 longitude 8.80 and on the time axis we want the entire year 2010 so 2010 January until 2010 December and we will encode this as CSV we execute and we see here the list of temperatures and let's say that we wanted to compute logarithm of these values now a lot of a lot of the values are negative so we cannot compute logarithm as it would result in an error and what we can do is to use a switch statement and tell the engine to compute logarithm only for the values that are above zero and for all others to return some default value and we can do that in the following way. 
we we'll use the switch okay In case our coverage is more than zero then we want to return log of this value and by default we want to return zero let's say and if we execute we will see that in the places where we had negative values zeros were put and in all other places logarithm of the value was computed the next operation that we will see is the coverage constructor the coverage constructor uses a set of iterators to go through the points and the values expression which is evaluated at every step of the iteration for example for creating the new one dimensional coverage with domain 0 100 which has cell value i at index i the following syntax can be used it starts with the keyword coverage it follows by the name of the coverage, the name that we want to give to the coverage, let's say my coverage then over the list of iterators, as we said it's one dimensional so we need one iterator over one dimension let's name it i followed by the axis definition which is the name that we want to give to the axis, let's say x and the domain 0, 100 followed by the values clause which is evaluated at each iteration step and the result is used for creating one point so basically at each step we want the point to have the value i which is the i from over here and if we execute this query we obtain indeed the coverage having 101 points and each point has the value equal to its index to its coordinate if for example we want the two-dimensional coverage with domain 0 100 0 100 and say that the cell value at i j is equal to i plus j we can do that by adding another iterator here so let's call it j and uh, the axis will call it y z 0 100 and the values we're going to say it's i plus j and because this is 2d we can actually encode it as png and display it as an image and we will obtain this kind of gradient where these points are closer to 0 and as we go here we are getting closer to 200 255 being white that's why you see the gradient okay so what use cases does the coverage constructor have the first example would be creating a histogram out of a coverage let's remember the temperatures data set for selecting the temperature in July 2005 we would write for C in average land temp, returning code C subset on C 2005 July. If we wanted to count in how many points the temperature was between 0 and 1, we would write returning code count and now we have to tell it what to count and we want to find out that in how many points the temperature was more than zero and less or equal to one two thousand five July actually I'll make it less than 1 and more equal to 0 and because this only returns one point I will tell it to give me to give it to me as PNG as CSV sorry. and executing this query I find out that in July 2005 there were 8842 points having temperatures between 0 and 1 
Now say that we wanted to do a histogram of the values between 0 and 20. So what we want is to create a new one-dimensional coverage with indexes going from 0 to 20, where each cell tells us how many values with temperature equal to the index, or in a range of 1 degree, as we have seen here, were there in July 2005. Basically we want to do the same thing, but not only for 0 and 1, we want it for all the values from 0 to 20. And we can do that using the coverage constructor. I will save this part because we will need it immediately. And we will do it with coverage. I will name it uh, temperatures histogram over an iterator, let's say t, the axis name, let's say temperature, going from 0 to 20. values and in the values clause we want to have what we had earlier however not 0 and 1 but actually more than t and less than t plus 1 if we execute this query basically we're the engine is going to answer the same question but for every point from 0 to 20. So, for example, we find out that in 6325 points the temperature was between 1 and 2. And we can plot it by specifying the keyword diagram. And uh, in this case, we could check the temperature distribution in this uh, in July 2005 and we can find out for example that in most points the temperature was between 19 and 20 and it was this was the case in 88,114 points. Another question that we can answer using the coverage constructor is how does the July temperature evolve in Bremen from 2001 to 2011? For answering this question, we must first understand that the coverage constructor iterator iterates over grid coordinates, not CRS coordinates. So if we have an axis with 10 grid points, but 100 degrees in latitude, to iterate through all the points, we must iterate from 0 to 9 and not from 0 to 100. Now we want to select the temperature in July in each year starting 2001, and for this we must find the grid points to iterate through. What we want to do, if, we, if you can imagine the cube, is to set the iterator on the month of July 2001, take the value, then jump 12 slices, take the value for 2002, jump another 12 slices, take the value for 2003, and so on. And we can do this using the following query. Coverage. Let's name it... Uh, Bremen July temps over we will need an iterator for the year year and the axis will name it year we will I said 2001 to 2011 there are 10 years between this so from 1 to 10 and um, values, we need at each iteration step to pick the temperature value in Bremen. So C subset, first the latitude and the longitude of Bremen, latitude 53.08, longitude 8.80, and for picking the right time, the first step you must know that the first slice of the data cube, of the data set, corresponds to February 2000. So first we want to position the iterator on the month of July, which is February plus 5. So I will write here plus 5, so I know that I move from February 5 slices onwards. Then, at the first step, I want to go in 2001. The first one is February 2000. 
Actually, I need to position myself on February 2001 and then jump to slices. And I can do that by writing year times 12. What this does in the first uh, in the first step of the iteration, it goes in 2001 February, then goes to July. At the second step, it goes into uh, February 2002 and then goes to July and so on. So if I execute this query, actually I have plotted it already as a diagram. Let's see it without the diagram. I see that the temperatures evolved in 2001. It was 25 point something, then 28 point something, then 23 point something. So here we can actually see that which years were actually uh, warmer, so 2005 was actually warmer and 2003 was actually colder. So this was for July, how about June? Now for June we know that we start from, from February, so instead of jumping 5 months we will simply jump 4 months. And these are the temperatures for June from 2001 until 2011. As I mentioned, the coverage constructor iterates over the grid domain. Sometimes it is not easy to figure out the grid domain. That is why there is an operation to figure it out for you. It is called image CRS domain and takes as arguments a coverage expression and the dimension name for which it returns the corresponding grid coordinates. So if I wanted to check the temperature in Bremen during 2010 using the coverage constructor, I could write coverage Bremen temps Uh, over month and the axis name let's say it's still month and here I want I would normally write the grid coordinates that correspond to the beginning and the end of 2010 I can write instead image CRS domain which takes two arguments the first one is the coverage expression for which I want the domain to be evaluated and in my case it's gonna be C subset ANSI 2010 January until 2010 December and the second argument is the dimension name for which I want the grid coordinates to be computed and in this case it is ANSI and here I will simply have to write month if I execute this I'm seeing the temperatures in 2010 in Bremen now the same query we have seen in the previous WCPS session and it can be written with a simple subset. The temperatures in Bremen in 2010 can be written like this. So return in code and simple subset uh, C latitude long longitude and ANSI. Now this will give us the same result as above. However, it is going to be much faster. This can be written as such because the subset is on a continuous domain. And this happens because the coverage constructor is the most general operation that WCPS provides and naturally it can express any of the other WCPS operations. However, because the coverage constructor is so general, optimization is difficult as well. Thus, we recommend using short-term operations whenever possible in order to obtain the fastest answer. So sometimes the difference can be of several orders of magnitude. This is why for continuous subsets, we recommend using the subset operation and not the coverage constructor. This was it about the coverage constructor part. The last type of WCPS operation that we are going to see during this webinar are the coverage condensers. Condensers are used to summarize the values of a coverage or coverage expression into a single value using a summarization function. 
They can also be used to summarize coverages into smaller dimensionality coverages, for example, compressing a data cube into a single image. The predefined summarization functions that we have seen in the previous WCPS session, for example, average, which was written like this, are particular cases of the general condense operation, which is similar to the coverage constructor. However, instead of defining a new point at each iteration step, the value accumulates into a single result. The general condenser can be used, for example, to find out how many data points are between January and December 2001 in our temperatures dataset. And we can write that in the following way. We are starting with the condense keyword, then we have to define the operation, the summarization function, which is in our case plus, over the iterators. So we wanted to find out how many data points are in 2001. So I'll call it month, month. And we want this to iterate in the domain from um, January 2001 to December 2001. And uh, if we don't know the indexes of the slices in the grid domain, we can use the image CRS domain function, image CRS domain, which takes two arguments. The first one, C subset ANSI starting from 2010 first until 2010 12. The second argument tells us the dimension for which we want to translate the, the domain. And finally, using defines what actually will be accumulated at each step. So the expression in using is going to be evaluated in each step and accumulated in the result. We just want to find out how many points are here, so we want for each point to use a 1. And if we execute this, we see that there are 12 points between 2001 and 2000, January 2010 actually, and December 2010. Um, how does this work? For the first, so initially the result is empty, then at the first step one is accumulated into the result. For the second step, which corresponds to February, one is accumulated again into the result, and so on until December. To find out the sum of all temperatures in Bremen in 2001, you can use a condenser and write the following expression. So condense plus over the domain from 2001 first until 2001 12 using and here we want to use the actual uh, value of the temperature for the corresponding month so what we will write here in Bremen is C subset lat uh, 53.08 longitude is 8.80 and on C of the month on which we are currently. And if we execute this, we find out that the sum of all temperatures in Bremen in 2001 has been 143.425 degrees. We can also use the condenser to collapse the cube into a single image. So say for example that we want to obtain a 2D slice where each cell is the average value at that specific location in 2001. So not just for Bremen, but for the entire world. So what we have to do from our previous query is to simply delete the subsetting on longitude and latitude and this will return us um, the entire slice corresponding to this month. So at each step we will have a 2D image, a 2D slice. Then at step 0 the result is empty. At step 1 the result is going to contain the temperatures for January 2001. At step 2, the result is going to contain the sum between the temperatures of January and February 2001, and so on. 
and to average we will simply divide by 12 and because this is an image this is 2D we can encode it as PNG and display it as image and here is our map of average temperatures for 2001 and the coverage constructor can be used together as well for example for kernel operations let's say that starting from the list of temperatures in Bremen in 2001 we want to obtain a new coverage where each pixel is the sum between the cell value and its left and right neighbors in the series to do that we can use a coverage constructor together with a condenser first let us select the list of temperatures in Bremen in 2001 again using a condenser, using a coverage constructor. So the syntax was coverage, the coverage name Bremen temps, over the iterator is ok, the months in 2001, values, C, subset on latitude 53.08, longitude 8.80 and on time we are okay with the month and uh, because this is 1d let's get it as comma separated values okay this is the list of temperatures and what we want now to do for example for the second pixel here we want the second pixel to be the sum between this one this one and this one I will actually select the temperature from 2012 December so that we can see the values for that will be used for the first one as well. So what we want to obtain is a series similar to this one where the first pixel is actually the sum between 2.2, 0.6, 3.6. The second pixel is the sum between 0.6, 3.6 and 7.2 and so on. And to do that we will iterate again starting from January 2001 and for each month we want the values to be a condenser I will save this expression for later so in each point I want to condense the value from the left the current value and the value to the right so I will write condense plus over an iterator let's call it x and the x is x as well the neighbor to the left is gonna be minus 1 as index until the neighbor to the right is gonna be 1 using and I want to use the actual values of the current neighbor so the actual value of the current pixel is the ANSI of month the the neighbor to the left is month minus one, the neighbor to the right is month plus one. So basically what we have here is month plus x. And if we execute this, we are obtaining a list of 12 temperatures. The first one is the sum between 2.20.6, 3.6. The second one is the sum between 0 0.6, 3.6, 7.2, and so on. This concludes our WCPS session. We hope that we have managed to show you that with simple queries, by taking advantage of the richness of the WCPS operations, you can easily express complicated processing workflows. Great. Thanks, Vlad. So, time to wrap up. WCPS, as a query language for spatial temporal coverages, is what we have inspected, and we have seen a few advanced operations that together constitute operational uh, support for linear algebra, for image and signal processing, statistics and visualization. We have seen particular functionality that is useful for doing advanced stuff like deriving new coverages on the fly or aggregating coverages along a particular axis. WCPS 2.0 will give us more like data metadata search, like polygon clipping 
so stay tuned. Still in 2015 this is going to be published. Again, thanks for bearing with me and bye for now. See you again.